Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. I'm here to talk to you about the subject of 62 Nickel. This has been uh, something that I uh, uh, have been pondering over at great length over the past year. Uh, ever since the uh, results uh, of the Garno test, which reported that uh, most of the isotopes, in fact all of the isotopes, seemingly had been transmuted to 62 nickel. When uh, Rossi's patent was disallowed by the US Patent Office, uh, it specifically said uh, that uh, there was no evidence for the aneutronic fruit fusion between uh, uh, protein and uh, uh, lithium-7. Uh, this got me a little bit upset, although he'd not got his paint and, and I'm no defender of Rossi, but I thought um, they're saying that there's literally no evidence that this could occur uh, in any literature or blah blah blah. So I thought, well actually, I think there probably is uh, with the work that Piantelli has done with Ficardi. And so I went and uh, on a two and a half week uh, endeavour, which kept me up most nights, and that was uh, Assuming Piantelli was right, going through the reaction tables uh, as he had shown when we were with him and just see what came out of the wash. Well, what came out of the wash was pretty much all of the nickel isotopes. If you assume Piantelli's uh, uh, theory, it, they progress towards nickel 62 uh, and nickel 64 goes around in a loop and ends up at nickel 62. So therefore we have a so-called experimental data uh, from the Ludana report saying that it's nickel 62 that you end up with and we have a theory that gives you an answer of nickel 62. The interesting thing is that nickel 62, um, well, the Lugano reactor was apparently, and there are people that discredit this, but there, it was apparently still producing excess heat at the end of the 32 day period, which means nickel 62 works. Okay, so uh, I mused on this for quite some time and I came to the conclusion that nickel 62 was probably ideal because it's the happiest element isotope in the universe uh, and so it just really doesn't want anything else in its party. Okay, so you know that was, uh, that, that, that was uh, an interesting finding. Before I go into the meat of, of this particular video, I'd like to say um, <laughs> thank you for the enormous res response we've had uh, to the first uh, small parts of the release that we're going to do over this symphony of the new FIRE uh, release program. Uh, we, we've had a significant amount of donations uh, it, it, of the order of four and a half thousand dollars and I've been distributing that to various members of the team and I, you'll be pleased to know that Alan is well on, in, on his way to making his garage look a bit like a NASA science fair. And uh, well, uh, Bob Higgins is taking a slightly different approach because he can't do the exact replication. So he is taking the approach of looking for as much radiation as he can see. Whereas uh, Mathieu Vallat in France, he is going to try and see if he can stimulate some excess heat. Uh, so essentially what's happening in uh, Santa Cruz in California, they are going to be tooling up. There's going to be things to look for UV, to, to look for uh, x-rays, to look for multiple different places to look for uh, um, x-rays and gammas. And there's going to be uh, uh, microwave detection. Uh, um, we're going to protect the power monitor and uh, it's going to be a really tooled up affair. Um, and we're about half the way towards getting him an Optus PI 160 uh, and then he will be able to give a broad uh, overview of the environment's temperature so he can study basically what's going on more than just the thermocouple data. So that's really cool what's going to happen in Santa Cruz. What's going to happen in New Mexico with Bob Higgins, he's uh, building an extremely robust and, and thorough uh, lead shielding apparatus. So he's going to have lead, he's going to have iron, he's going to have copper, he's going to have boric acid in there, all to basically remove anything from the background. Uh, and then he's going to try and design a cell that's specifically designed to let out as much radiation as possible uh, uh, in these whatever maybe UV, uh, um, ultra UV, soft x-rays, hard x-rays, gammas, whatever, whatever's coming out of this cell, we want to see as much as possible. So he's going to be focusing on that. And in France, uh, Matthew is going to be putting uh, the reactor 
possibly we, we, we're just coming to this uh, the decision in, in like a, a kind of boat, like a, a half semi semicircle of um, uh, steel that will be filled with uh, tungsten powder um, that we were going to put in the reactor, but actually we're going to put it on the outside. I think that's probably a, a good approach now. So we're looking for heat, we're looking for uh, uh, radiation, and we're going to be looking for um, uh, for an exact replication in Santa Cruz. Other than that, uh, many of the replicators, we've got replications in Norway and Sweden, uh, in uh, Russia, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, in uh, the UK, uh, in, in Italy, it, obviously in France, uh, in the US, in Canada, and we're pretty sure it's being conducted in, in, in China and in India. Uh, and so there's a very large spread of replications that are going on. There is a two week probably lead time minimum because people have to get the materials in and uh, they have to then process uh, following the formula that we uh, published uh, last week. Uh, one of those uh, parties, a university party, uh, it's been really flattering to have a, a two hour conversation with Arapa here at the University of Missouri yesterday. He took a very open approach. Uh, I still have to get back to him with some data. He's been extremely, extremely busy uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, but uh, he is going to uh, uh, build on the experiments he was already doing, where he saw unusual pressure data. But he didn't uh, use free lithium, and he didn't prepare, bake, or, or dehydrogenate his nickel prior to the starting of the reaction. I'm a little disappointed, actually, but it's an un not unexpected that there are some people at other universities that have been basically saying we don't have anything, saying that we're basically meaningless, uh, and uh, that is really unfortunate. And I just appeal to those people, you know, if you want to have fun criticising us, do it in a year's time, okay? But, but right now we're trying our best. We're citizen scientists and we're funded by citizens, okay? This can't be stopped. No amount of getting upset about what we're doing is going to stop it. We're all over the world doing these replications, and this will happen, for better or worse. Having said that, I would really encourage those people that haven't had an opportunity to uh, uh, donate or take part in the live open science that's being conducted at quantumheat.org to go to our site, see the data, download the data. Alan yesterday took the entire data off HugNet and put it into two convenient files for easy download. So I'd, I'd suggest you go there, you'll have the spectrometer data, the power data, the, the uh, temperature and pressure data. You can pull those all together and do your own analysis. Okay. So, the signal. The signal is totally critical. The cookbook is in the signal, and I really mean that when I say it. I mean that because it is the key. It's like the Rosetta Stone to this story. Essentially, that let me know, let us know as a group, who is telling the truth out there in the research field of New Fire. And that person is Pian Telly. So we were on the right track last year when we did all that analysis. But when you think about it, when you think about his theory, and I will expand on that in huge detail. Uh, when you think about his theory and th some things he said to us, things start falling into place. Thank you, Pian Telly. What I'm about to share with you is autoconsistenza, okay? What that means is whatever we're doing and whatever we're finding, it's consistent with the signals. The two types of signals we saw, the big peak, what well, looks like Bremsstrahlung radiation, but it doesn't have any characteristic radi radiation, uh, characteristic X-rays. And then the subsequent peaks that appear to be below uh, 100 kV. Now, there's a lot of criticism about the size of the, the, the so-called COP. Frankly, I, I'm not that interested in the COP right now. And we've got very good understanding from the data and from Ross, what Rossi said in the past, why the COP is that lo lower than uh, he's claimed. Also, as I said last year and have been saying quite a lot, if you have nickel 62, the aneutronic fusion that that would uh, propagate in the, in the lithium uh, uh, would be the bulk of the heat gain. So you're not just wasting your, your, your sunk protons uh, uh, in, in, into the nickel, you're, you're able to bounce those out in a springboard fashion, as is in the document which will be in the links provided to this video. 
Now I want to share with something that's really rather cool. Why? Why did he want to put nickel 62 and nickel 64 in there? Let's have a look at the isotopic data. Okay, so I donated to the Wikipedia Foundation and I am incredibly indebted to Jimmy Wales for setting that up. If you haven't and you appreciate what we've done, please donate to the, the Wikipedia Foundation. I have nothing to gain from doing that, but it was instrumental in crowd science in finding this. Okay, so what is the isotopic data for nickel? Okay, this is off Wikipedia, it's a grab. Okay, I just want to say. It. And basically you've got 58 nickel, that is 68% of naturally occurring nickel. You've got 59, well no that's not in there. 60, you've got 26%. You've got 61, that's 1%. Then you've got 62, 3.6% and uh, 64 nickel, 0 0.009. This isn't a lot is it? I mean this is like, well, what have we got here between 62 and 64 nickel? We have maybe, mm, I don't know, 4.5% of the whole lot is that. Now, if you're going to re enrich that and you assume the theory that uh, the, the, the lithium-7 is, is the bulk of the reaction, then you would get to a point where um, you were doing more electronic fusion in the, in, in the lithium, and then that would basically allow you to up the COP. So if you had a reaction that when, as I described in the previous video, you're back reflecting terahertz radiation that's stimulated and, 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 and in the, the uh, deep absorbing material that's uh, coupled to the reactor surface, when you, are, when you are stimulating that and you get a self-sustained mode, that gives you your COP, okay? And if your minimum is six, maybe that's from natural nickel. Or maybe it's not, maybe it's from slightly enriched nickel. Now the evidence from the Ghana suggests that the process of running the reactor will enrich the nickel. So over a period of time you'll be breeding the nickel you need. It won't be $11,600. Now that $11,600 is for one gram. That's the price that uh, uh, we found and whilst we were searching for where to get it from, we found this company and uh, they told us that they had previously sold nickel 62 enriched to Rossi. Okay, so, if we are to assume that uh, uh, he's putting nickel 62 and 64 in there, what? What is the real reason for him doing that? You're going to love this. You're going to so love this. It's because it's heavy. That's what it's for. It's heavy. Okay, so look at the mass data here. You've got 58 nickel, which is normally 68% of naturally occurring nickel. What's 57.9 mass number? Now look, going down here, 64 is 63. That's a big spread. Now the process, which I will talk in detail as part of this ongoing release, which we've only just scratched the surface of. This process allows uh, Acaminas Hydrogeno into the uh, uh, nickel atom. And what would happen if I was dropping a ball on the Earth and I was dropping a ball on Saturn? Yeah, well, okay, the bigger the planet would suck down the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the ball faster, right? It's just intuitive, yeah? If you're heavy, you're going to get the thing going in faster you're going to get it in going in more likely. Yeah, that's just it. Okay, now <laughs> I'm not going to just stop there, right? There's another aspect to this. In Rossi's painting, he specifically singles out isotopes. Now, as I will explain in other videos, Piantelli says that any transition metal will work. And I would urge you to go and look at the quantum mechanical models for the electron uh, uh, probability distributions for uh, transition metals and any elements anyway. Why, and, and what I'm saying is when you know that, you will know that any transition metal works and it won't be something you have to test. You will know it will work. 
But really, nickel's a great choice because it's super cheap. Uh, it's does a very large amount on the on the planet. Uh, it's an incredibly well uh, uh, developed industrial process to produce carbonyl nickel. It has the right nanostructures on the on the micrometric material. Everything about it is great. And you know what? It doesn't have a lot of reaction outcomes. And the reaction outcomes it has is good. I mean, if it wasn't, we had already heard about it, okay, from the one megawatt test. And we didn't see anything bad coming out of the, the Garner test, okay? So it's good. It's, it's a good choice. It's cheap. It's the right shape. It's ubiquitous. Why not use it? It's a great catalyst. And, it, and it's known to, uh, to increase the, the uh, dehydrogenation of lithium aluminium hydride. Anyway, that aside, I want to draw your attention to the periodic table. In Rossi's painting, although Piantelli says you can use any uh, transition metal in this process, he singled out group 10 elements. Here we go, group 10. Nickel, yeah, well, we know that works. Well, at least we think so. Palladium and platinum. Now, if you do the reaction table from palladium, you're talking over 950 outcomes. That's not a good thing to study as a scientist. So it makes sense from a science point of view to not do palladium. Okay? But why choose these elements here? Okay. <laughs> you're going to like this. It's because they're heavy! It's they're heavy! They're heavy! These ones are heavy. Like, these ones are not so heavy. These ones are heavy. Okay? But more than that, they have the right electron shell configuration. Yeah? You'll learn that later. But anyway, they're heavy, right electron shell configuration, and the nick is good because it's got not very many reaction outcomes. That's why it's done there. Now here we go again. Alto consistenza. Everything makes sense. Everything makes sense. What's in the painting, it makes sense. It's all derived from Piantelli's work. All. You can't know Piantelli's work and not end up with that. It's the right choice. And moreover, you would choose whatever isotopes in there that are the heaviest. So, that's basically the reveal for this video. Uh, I'd re really encourage you to uh, uh, donate if you can. And uh, thank you very, very much for watching. Any questions, please come to quantumheat.org and ask them, and we'll endeavor to answer them. Thank you for watching.